lives as teachers. And yeah, so I'm going to read super quickly who we are, the ones that will be like, um, we will do like this methodology that is called fishbowl at the beginning. We want to share our ideas. We want to put our, some questions that we have on the table. And so I'm going to read a bit of bio super quick. So we have Yoko and Tao. I'm going to show pictures of who we are and our mountains. Just one minute, I just did this super quick. <laughs> yes, so we have Yoko and Tao here. Yes. Uh, so Yoko and Tao are two homo sapiens who were born, who were born in Changsha and now living with a cat in an Italian pre-Alps village called Pastur. So they will come to introduce us to the Alps. We have, uh, this is uh, Xingning, sorry, I have, yeah. Uh, this is our friend that brings, uh, sorry, 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 sorry. <laughs> Some patience. Yeah, she's currently working on deepening her knowledge and bond with the mountainous community with the Himalayas, Hendlan mountain range with guidance from the surroundings, Tibetan sacred mountain. She serves to develop programs that facilitate a process of de-learning, relearning, and remembering. This is the picture that she brought from the Himalayas. And we have uh, Hero and me. I'm going to be super quickly. Uh, Hero is an amateur mountaineering climbing, climber, member of Akiteño Mountaineering Club. He is doing his PhD program in Latin American study at the University of Simón Bolívar in Ecuador. Uh, he's specializing in mountain history. His research focus on Ecuadorian Andinismo in the second half of the 20th century. His main concerns are the social, environmental, and interconnected facets of the practice of the activity. When he is not reading mountaineering, he wanders around the sketchy terrain in the mountains. And this is me, um, I'm a relational cl uh, artist, climber, I'm part of the Reimagining Education Conference, part of the universities, where we are wondering how will a university will look like if it is in service of earth and life in general. So with that, and with our mountains here, I want to open the space. Uh, we wanted to start uh, with something around why are we putting mountains together? And I want to invite uh, Hero first to share about this and then we will chip in around this. So, yeah. Hero, can you um, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for coming. Uh, thank you also, Andrea, for uh, holding this space. Um, so, um, wait, if I understood correctly, like, we tell something about mountains as connected spaces. Is that the idea to start off? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, as Andrea said, I've been studying mountaineering history for a couple of years now. And one of the things that I noticed is that uh, through mountaineering, mountains are a very connected uh, space or are connected spaces. So, um, I will be mainly focusing or talking about mountaineering, but obviously um, there are many other ways um, that mountains are connected spaces. What I think is very interesting is that within mountaineering, we have this thing that we're calling right now um, learning circuits, where mountaineers kind of need to transit through different places, spaces, mountains, um, even cities sometimes um, to gain more experience and become uh, uh, an experienced mountaineer. And so these circuits have like a very local dimension. So someone that grew, grows up in the Himalayas, in the Alps or in the Andes has a very different circuit to begin with. So here in Quito, for instance, there are a couple of, we're actually very spoiled uh, with mountains. There are, I don't know, maybe over 10, 15, 4,000 meter peaks. There are um, close to Quito over uh, four, no, even five, I think, uh, 5,000 meter peaks and one 6,000 meter peak uh, a couple of hours um, away. And um, so a local mountaineer will always go like first to the easy mountains and then go to uh, gradually harder and harder uh, climbs and a little bit higher up as well. 
And um, what I've been uh, studying is one of these phenomena where climbers actually go to other parts of the Andes, for instance, in Peru, Bolivia, Chile, Argentina, and um, they go on expeditions to gain more uh, experience. And I've seen that this is actually a, um, a, a worldwide phenomenon, so to speak, and where like these three main mountain chains are connected through mountaineering. So um, there are a lot of Ecuadorian mountaineers going to the Himalayas every year, guides and amateur mountaineers, but there are also people from the Alps visiting the Andes, um, going mountaineering in Ecuador, Colombia, Peru. Um, and uh, so there we have like this this triangle and i think andrea made a very careful selection to invite uh, some people from every uh, well of these three mountain ranges and obviously there are much more mountain ranges uh, around the world which are in some sort of way also connected but i think this connection like alps um, and these and himalayas is very uh, important um and so yeah i would start off with that Thank you, Herr, for that. Maybe like I, I can share it's something that for me, it's uh, like as a mountaineering and also thinking about how to do pedagogies with mountains. These ideas of circuits of learnings for us, like we went to Peru in the Andes, like the, the, the Andes mountains have like, they cross South America. So each country has a different Andes chain. And it has different, uh, like, I, I feel like it has different teachers. So uh, like in Ecuador, we have these teachers that are easy to get to in quote unquote, like this Chimborazo mountain, it's uh, accessible. Like we could do it in two days. We could visit that elder in two days. And in Peru, for example, we need like, uh, like a, to walk 19 kilometers to get there and then to just be there for like two days and then come back like we need expeditions for that like four days or five days expeditions and it's there are also like a different type of elders right like um they have like a different energy and then like each each part uh, has uh for me has a different learning and that's like something that we've been, that's why I feel like every every space of mountaineering and, and every space of mountains and, and the nature that it's around, the glaciers, the paramo, like the the the, the part of that it's in the in, in the bottom of the, the highlands brings so much, like brings a lot of, of lessons. And maybe I want to ask questions, like we can put some questions in the middle or you can comment, Yoko, Shin, eh, Tao, Shin, and Hero. Like um, the question of what is your relationship with the mountains? Like how can, what, did, what they have told you, what do you have feel with them? And yeah, I want to put that there. So who? So we start first. Start from us. So we <laughs> we we grew up and um, in the city. We born and grew up in a city, city like complete city, with no um, real mountains around. And we moved to here um, in the mountain since. 12 years ago, almost 12 years ago. And um, we started, we, we moved here not because we want to retreat from the city or we want to um, hide from anything in the city, but we, we, we thought we, uh, we, we were just graduated from uh, Milan and we wanted to find a cheaper place to live. And so we moved here and we like hiking at, um, back in the day. So we started as uh, amateur hikers and moved here in the mountain, uh, just walking around and go to the um, visit or the mountain tops. Mm -hmm. To be specific, we, it's not like 
only hike that hikes around, but mountaintop goers mm. that we need to go to the peak of each mountain to um, say we were there in the mountain. So that's the beginning, but, um, and then gradually we um, turn from this kind of uh, sportive activity into uh, nature observers in general, because mm. our, uh, as said in the bio, we have a cat and one day our cat caught a long tailed tit, that's a typical mountain bird here back home. And we, by that moment, we start to have bird watching. We started to have, uh, we began our bird watching activities. So we start to watch uh, bird and nature in general around rather than just walk around and go to the tops. And rather, so gradually we stop, go to the tops mountain tops but just walk around and watch all the lives and plants and animals around yeah and sometimes uh, uh, so we have the relationship with mountain as hikers as bird watcher or nature lovers and we also forage in the mountain uh, especially in these years, we start to learn what kind of plants we can eat and how to cook them and how people um, uh, eat in the mountains in the past. So we learn um, by foraging. So it's there's also this foraging relationship. And also we... Uh, in us, in especially last winter, we felt a bit depressed uh, by so many reasons combined. So suddenly, it become the the depression hits, and we started to kind of afraid or even hate the mountains. We want so we 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 booked a trip to the sea, and we say we don't we don't want to see the mountains anymore. So the, the, there's also this kind of um, relationship. So yeah, I think yeah. So in conclusion, it was like at the beginning we we were just like normal mountain visitors. Even yeah. if we lived here and we go out, we we went out to hike around. But at that time, our mindset is like still visitors. So we hike around to reach the summits and to to gain the so-called achievements. But then after having the binocular and the guidebooks of flower, birds and mushrooms and trees and butterflies and so on, we started to become an observer of nature. And gradually through this process, we kind of knew, got to know nature more and more. And um, also our love for nature, for different forms of lives uh, grow. Yeah. Yeah, grew all, all the time. And then from a certain time, we finally settled in the mountain area. It's like we really become the in, in, inhabitants, inhabitants here. So then it's not, it's no longer an observer or visitor. We are really the residents here. So we start to like forage mm -hmm. and to eat the wild plants or berries or fruits. So it's like um, it just become our er uh, everyday life. And then gradually we want to really live here. But during this process, there are some hard times. For example, the last winter, we got uh, we just turned off the gas of our house. We we want to collect woods in the forest to burn them to warm up ourselves, and then we we got to know kind of our, our limits, our um, 
physical limits and also mental limits. So that's basically our experience till now from the beginning yeah, so of living in this same mountain, like for 10 years. Yeah, so, so the conclusion of the conclusion is that the relationship uh, is always changing. It's always changing, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I want to say, I echo with you, Yoko and Tal, the relationship is changing, it's love and hate. At the beginning, I thought you guys going to sing a praising song to the mountains. I said, okay, what am I going to say? But it's true that love and hate um, comes along the way. Um, my story, it's, it's also love and hate and complicated. I come from a mountain, mountainous regions in China, in the northern China. So going to the mountains is almost like every weekend, uh, every other weekend for me and my family. So I, when I grown up and, you know, wanted to um, get a job in the city, I kind of want to escape that mountain it's you know it's secluded it's hard to it's hard to travel and um, um information doesn't flow and easily and quickly and it feels like you know um bigger city will brings more information as, as as young people and then just i don't know for maybe fate or maybe just life uh, my work I um, brought me back to the mountains but to this mountains behind behind me much much more wild um, to the Himalayan Hengduan mountain range to the western and um, southwest um, of China that's where the Tibetan cultural region and many, actually many other um, es and ethnic groups are living around this uh, Hongduan mountain range. Um, I start to realize that diversity of these areas, because where I grown up, that mountains doesn't bring diversity. It's more of a, you know, a group of people with one story, one narrative and working, uh, living in the mountain. And they, that's how um, there, there's wisdom being developed by living in that mountain, but um, uh, belief-wise, spiritual belief-wise, it doesn't as um, is it doesn't as uh, work as um, diverse as where we are in the Hongduan mountain range, and we have multiple, very, very uh, variety of uh, ethnic groups living here side by side, and each one of them will have um, their narrative, their stories about how the universe is created and how their tribe came to be. And actually, if you hear the tribe stories from, from one to another along the Hengduan mountain range, people notice that their stories are related, the stories are coherent, and the stories are told by their ancestors, the traveling from the um, wild west Tibetans going to the north and going down to the south through the Hongduan mountain range. And that's where diversity happens. And that's also where um, coherence of um, uh, an inheritance also happens in this region. So that brought me instant love to this place. Um, I wouldn't bore you with all the hate parts because it is difficult, it is not easy and travels and distance, it's just vast, it's beyond human, it's beyond human scale. And one thing, well, many things I've learned from the mountain. One is um, reverence, you know, that's, and I think you will echo with me that how tiny I am, how uh, helpless I am in front of this <laughs> majestic being. Uh, but also I learned from it is trust, um, trust time and trust in human effort being in this area. It's that trust of humans' um, agency, Act, active a hum, active human agency would be able to work in this harsh environment and actually make it quite a good living there. So one last example, this tower behind me, the stone watch tower, it's named to be the um, um, mystic uh, um, stone tower of Himalayan and, and this was built uh, south of 200 about around years ago and resist multiple earthquakes still people don't know what was originally built for but it was such a fortress and it's very 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 skillfully made um, a lot of geometries and uh, physics around it and their scholars starting to get notice of these areas and come to learn. And actually it's very hard to be 
um, very hard to be uh, replicated uh, today. You know, no one is able to do the same thing again. Even some of the watchtower has its own story. It says it's, it was the God who came to make this. So it's a mystery. I like one of our one of our friends who uh, sent in the chat box said that the the, the, the mountains brings that mystery that brings an opportunity to um, a reverence and different way of knowing. And then I also think that's a um, opportunity for pedagogy and education as well. I will stop here for now. Um, so my relationship with the mountains, um, well, well, yeah, I, I think uh, is is is, um, mm, is is very obviously personal. Um, but I grew up in in Belgium, so it's a, a very flat place. Uh, so the highest hill in Belgium is around 700 meters high. Uh, but my mother is from Ecuador. And so we came always uh, on holidays to Ecuador. And we spent uh, most of the time in a little place called Guaranda, which is a little um, city kind of surrounded just by mountains. And there isn't much uh, to do, so to speak. And um, with my cousins, we always wandered to the countryside and to the mountains. And from Guarara, we can actually see the mountain that Andrea showed at the beginning, uh, Chimborazo, very clearly. And so um, as a teenager and as a kid, I grew up with this idea of, um, of wandering into the mountains and, and, and exploring uh, the mountains. And I've been living now in Ecuador for um, eight years. So I moved uh, as an adult to Ecuador. And um, I think, yeah, for me, the relationship with with these mountains, with this little part of the Andes, is obviously very intimate because we, as mountaineers, we always kind of wander around. And yeah, there's always this idea of, of, of going over a specific route or or, or going to a summit. Um, and uh, lately, we had a conversation with some friends and we said, like, there must be something else than, than just conquering a mountain because historically speaking, mountains have always been a place of, of, uh, of conquest, uh, at least in in European eyes and so we came to a conclusion that there must be some kind of way um, where you can co-create with the mountain so I love this idea that as a mountaineer you kind of co-create um, with a space with a mountain and you always go in dialogue because you always are asking yourself how am I feeling how is the mountain feeling how um, are the conditions and um, I think that process has uh, has taught me a lot about uh, yeah myself uh, even about my friends and how um, we 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 relate to each other because it's a very um, a very intense activity. Sometimes you need to sometimes depend uh, your life depends uh, literally on, on on your bodies, so you need to be very conscious on who you're walking with, where you're going, and so on and so on. And so yeah, this little piece of the Andes um, I think is fascinating because we're as I said very spoiled. There's um, so many landscapes and so many mountains. Um, that we can, I think every, yeah, as Andrea said, like every mountain has like a different teaching. And um, that has been really fascinating uh, to me the last uh, couple of years. I, I, I want to also answer and then my, my question, <laughs> our question, we created that before. Um, just for me, I feel like I, I, I grew up also in the city. But here, Quito is a city that is in the mountain. And uh, like here, I, well, now I can't see it because it's crowded. But here in front of me, I have the mountain. And it's like a way of ori orienting our lives. Like, oh, the mountain is there. OK, north. Like, <laughs> we all, like since I, I was a little girl. So we have that, I feel, in Quito, like this, uh, this, the, these cities that are in the middle of the mountains. Uh, we got that. We get that feeling. I feel. I feel that super strongly. And since I was little, I kind of. I remember once the first time that I was in a mountain. My father took me when I was like six or seven, and I didn't know what was happening. I was like, oh, "What? Why do I? What? I feel uncomfortable. I can't walk. Why? <laughs> like, <laughs> what is happening?" And like five years ago, I went through the same path. That same path. And I was able to bring myself there. So I felt that a feeling of being able to be alone in the mountain, to bring myself there, to be able to walk that mountain, that it's the city mountain. 
And that feeling that I can only get with nature, that that resonance of beauty of what we are able to do in a way that it's, I feel that it, it for me, it's uh, my relationship with that. It's a way of breaking my head from this capitalist system that tells you that you're worthy because you have a title or now, oh, now you pass this test, now get this title. For me, when I'm in the mountain, it's like that step. When I was a little kid, I didn't know what was happening. Now I'm a grown up. I can bring myself everywhere so that it has, it brings that feeling of, of now you can do it on your own. Now it's, yeah, like it's kind of a blessing I feel from the mountain that it brings me to, to it, it kind of holds me. It's a space for me to, to in a way, like, using a word that comes from the system like a validate myself um with with in with nature so it is like something that and it's not something that i get like a degree it's something that i feel everywhere because when when i walk the mountains i feel like i'm i'm connecting them with myself and i love this idea from this pedagogy of ubuntu like everyone can teach everyone can learn and this invitation of uh, I feel nothing in the mountains too, like like Shilin said, like we are nothing, and at the same time we are everything with them. And the mountains are also I feel like the mountains are also learning with us, like this invitation on this online the space of bringing their spirits here, like with us because we walk them, we know them. I feel it's also like our, we are messengers, and it's not like. We have to go to talk to the mountains and bring them into a zoom <laughs> but it's a feeling that they are also learning when we walk them when we when we bring them into our conversations when we think about pedagogies with them when we think about how to do our lives with them like to co-create with them to to learn from them and also to bring this for for them so for me it's like bringing this idea of horizontality also into the space of nature, it's like this incredible and beautiful spirit that has to us something super special. And we can also give something from them because we are learning from, from this. So that's kind of also my relationship. And also like this part of uh, the, the indigenous culture here, like many cultures have also many stories here. And for me has always been like, um, this relationship of, of the spirits of the mountains, like we call them here, they call them apples. We we were looking at a paper with Hero that uh, since he's studying mountaineering and this is like super colonial practice, how did people here look at the mountains before? And it's here they are, they look at them as spirit helders, like they are taking care of a territory. It's not something that you conquer. It's a, it's our, an elder. It's a friend. It's it's something that is there to protect you, to hold you also, and so that's kind of also like um, something that we always try to put into the space, like in this mountaineering club. There, it's really nice because there are some people that before they walk the mountain, they ask for permission, and they like give an acknowledging because it's so big also it's just you need to stop for a minute and acknowledge it always so this invitation of mindfulness of being there all the time for me it's kind of a beautiful learning and yeah i wanted to to leave it there for now mm, i don't know if some of you want to do a question or should i put the questions that we have do you have something that resonates maybe um I would like to uh, um, a little bit like, uh, yeah, as you were saying that um, when we are in touch with the mountain, uh, we kind of understand like how, how small we are in front of it. And I think like, at least for me, it kind of shows, um, like show us uh, the, what the priorities are. Like uh, Andrew was saying, like uh, sometimes on, in, the, in the city, basically we live Mm, we are just so focused on our degrees or basically we are we stop being people and we just become a degree like uh, I'm a master I'm a PhD I'm an engineer um, but that's not who we are like when we are one-to-one -one with the mountain with with the lands basically that the, 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 the a degree is 
worthless. Um, and the thing is that uh, we realize that she's mm, like the earth uh, is our host, is like our, our mother and kind of shows that we have to act according to that, like to show respect and she will bring her blessings to us. And for example, well, I'm not mm, mountaineer. I like to hike, but I'm really uh, a rookie, really a rookie on that. Uh, but yeah, like being on, on a mountain, I, it feels like we can share our spirit with the spirit of the mountain and learn. Um, that's something I like, like, uh, like to say, like, uh, to, um, something like, montaña, like to hear the, the sound of mountain, like, um, I can explain that. Uh, can it, we can recharge our energies in there, and uh, on that on that silence, uh, we can our spirits can can sing, you know. So mm, that is my um, my experience uh, with 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 the mountain. Basically, I think that a mountain keep us humble. That's mm, that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. Um, you are, I'm, I'm going to put another question. I feel like <laughs> to to Shinli, to Yoko, and Her. Thank you, David, for that. Um, so we have like this idea. We talked about these challenges of living in the mountains, and with challenges, I want to put also in the table like. What have you, what the stories have you heard from being there? Uh, what like projects, what ideas, like to put on the table what resonates with you in relationship to challenges that are also could be opportunities, right? I, I want to open that wherever that wants to. Maybe we can do the same, like Yoko and Tao, you have something there. And challenges are we going to talk about challenges yes challenges and stories that comes with them like if you have uh yeah uh i think it's basically heat and feet like what eat and eat eat and heat or heat and feed <laughs> how to get yourself warm and how to feed yourselves. Um, well, in fact, if we don't think um, and we just take what we have here, it's absolutely, we can, we can live quite in the same way as we live in a city because we, the, the, the house, the, we are living in an apartment and it's supplied by electricity, by gas, Wi-Fi, and internet. Mm -hmm. So we are quite well served. We can uh, pay to warm ourselves up and to have light in the dark and to drink tap water. Um, and we basically to buy anything from Amazon. Because if you order something from Amazon, it can be delivered here. Yeah, because we have the, uh, the we have a door number, mm -hmm. and um, so the challenge really depends on what the life we want to live. So yeah. um, for us, the real challenge begins when we start to think about um, self sufficient or um, live more autonomously, which means as humans or as a member of the great animal kingdom, can we live on our own, like facing nature directly without um, being supported by the um, gas pipes, by the water pipes, and by the whole um, economic system. That's when the real challenge 
begin. So in the last winter, we try to turn off the gas. We try to collect woods by ourselves because fortunately we have a fireplace here in, in this apartment. So we start to um, experiment with the fireplace. And then we went to the, uh, uh, the mountain just behind us, like in you know, 10 minutes walking and collect those uh, fallen woods on the, in, in the forest and use our backpack to carry them back and burn them. Um, then I broke my back. Twice. Uh, yeah, so uh, it's quite, um, uh, uh, how to say, it's, 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 it's like I, I want to um, live a life which my body doesn't permit uh -huh. me to live. That's very frustrating, you, you see. It's like I'm a, uh, uh, I want to walk, but I don't have legs. Yeah. Uh, probably because of uh, the uh, lifestyle we have before and my maybe my physical body has uh, the, 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 has some deformities or thing, something that, and maybe I don't have a good posture when I carry the woods from the, uh, a sloped hill, I don't know, then I broke my back. And when I broke my back, I cannot carry the woods anymore. So what, what, what I'm gonna do? Am I going to turn on the gas? Am I going to ask uh, for help? Am I going to buy some woods from the neighbors? So yeah, it was very um, a frustrating moment. Mm. And uh, yeah, the same thing happens with, uh, for example, water. We we can go to a water source to bring water by ourselves, and all it, it all including um, it, it all it's all related with uh, um, physical work, and we need to carry the waters with us. Um, we need to carry the woods. It's all yeah related to our body so we we got to um learn our to use our bodies again so it's not it but in in the past we um relate ourselves to the world mostly with our mind with our brains with our our words um spoken words or thinking but in the mountain we have to talk with it physically we have to talk with it with with our bodies and yeah that's physical challenge i would say is what we are experiencing wow. and now mm -hmm. and um and and i think this physical challenge also leads to mental your challenge. mental sometimes even collapse because if you look at a blackbird or um say um yeah any kind of wild animals you see they just run running the, around and doing their things they know exactly what they they need to do and what they want to do and they do it nicely and then if you look back to yourself even if you studied in university and different kind of schools for many years but you are not taught the things that you really need to know to survive meaning to meet your a basic human need like to eat and uh, warm yourself and then apart from lacking of knowledge of doing this kind of basic things you don't really have the uh, physical strength to do it after you know how to do. So it all really kind of shake your soul to the deepest level. It's like after all these years, I've been like 36 year old and I, I, 
I'm even, you know, like in a sense, less capable than um, a bird, a wild bird who really knows what to do and live nicely. Yeah, exactly like what um, Andrea and um, Harold said, we cannot, um, the degree is means nothing here. We cannot eat a degree. Probably we can burn a degree to <laughs> to warm up ourselves. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it's like you spend a lot of time and energy on learning things, but uh, since you shift the habitat, let's say, you change your environment. Then in this new home, they are kind of useless. Yeah. Yeah. So this is very yeah. It's a uh, so far, the biggest challenge probably. That, does does doctoral degree burns longer than a master degree? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's it. That's for us. Thank you. Um, yeah, um, well, there are many stories um, in the mountains where I live. I will share two. And one is a story from the mountain that I sh just shared uh, with you, Andrea, at the introduction. Um, if you could, um, if you don't mind share that image again, I could, um, I could tell the story of that mountain. Two years ago, um, it was in the COVID, um, still in the COVID era. I hope we all, um, we still have that memories. And two two years ago, I was uh, right here in front of this mountain in the south and uh, southwest Sichuan. It's called Genie, and um, I was working in the um, in a primary school, um, setting up some furniture with a carpenter. And the carpenter was a very um, uh, typical Khan nomads man, and he had not been out of his village his whole life. Maybe his village he had been out, but not going anywhere out of the province, anywhere further away. And that was the year in the summer, everywhere in China was having this big flood, very heavy flood, and seeing before, even the city in the central China start to have a flood um, in the subways, a lot of casualty. Um, I was reading the news while um, standing on this beautiful um, highland plateau in Himalayan, working with this nomad carpenter um, for primary school. I was telling him how lucky we are right here uh, in the plateau. It's sunny and it's beautiful and you have no idea outside of here. There are floods, there's um, disasters, water disasters. And he looked at me and he raised his head to this mountain, this image right in front of us. And he said, can you see this mountain? When I was young and that big um, stone in the middle was covered by snow in, in the summertime. Um, we have a saying in Tibetans, when our snow mountain is as wide as coach, um, our world is fine. And when the mountains start to um, have black dots and the world start to uh, fall apart, and when it becomes uh, black and the world is about to end. And I am not surprised at all that your part of the world has more water because my part of the world has less water. And that very casual and simple um, saying um, changed, my, changed my view of our connectedness. And as earlier we saying, you know, at the beginning of our conversation, mountain is a connected space. It's not only mountain ranges that connecting as a backbone of the earth, also the, the um, climatology, the water uh, uh, circulations around the world. Scientifically, I think that's very much related. It's very much connected. And we have so little knowledge about it so far. And that's something urgently being, need, needs to be added into our, our uh, curriculum. But beyond that, I think that's indigenous wisdoms and stories, whatever you call it, it's not scientific and it doesn't have to be scientific. And that's something go parallel with scientific knowledge that we all need to also put into our curriculum is to, um, is that um, that's, is that this indigenous um, stories and wisdom that go um, generation by generation. But I was lucky that I was probably, um, a generation that not a con nomad, 
and Vanessa Han Chinese carrying that story with me. And I see it very, um, I'm very honored that I'm able to share that story with all of you today here that I'm passing on that story as well. Um, so yeah, so that's, uh, that's, that's my story. Thank you. I think for the case of Ecuador, um, living in the mountains is not necessarily um, hard because the cities are in fairly warm valleys. Our climate is sometimes a bit harsh. So when there's sun, it's, you, you get burned really easily, at least I do. When it rains, uh, it rains really hard. But the other, uh, like last week, we went on some sort of uh, road trip um, with friends and Andrea. And um, there was a landslide. So we needed to take some alternate uh, roads. And um, there are a couple of regions here in the country, um, uh, up to 3,500 meters, even 4,000 meters, uh, where there um, are several indigenous communities. And I think those places are really harsh to live because it's cold, it's always misty, uh, it's always humid. Um, there isn't always electricity, running water, and so on. And I think that's a very um, telling sign about the history of this country as well, where uh, colonization made that the cities are kind of um, nice places to live. And the indigenous communities were always pushed to the boundaries and to the outside of the cities and um, were forced to live in, in high mountainous uh, spaces, which were not always inhabited. So um, they kind of needed to adapt adapt crops, uh, crops, animals, and so on and so on. And so I think um, in that sense, Ecuador is a, unfortunately a product of its own history where um, living in the cities, in the, in the warmer valleys um, is, is in general fairly uh, pleasant, I would say, like to, to, to live uh, within the mountains, but there are a whole bunch of communities living up to 4,000 meters where the climate is so, uh, it's always cold in some sort of way. And um, when it gets sunny, um, I don't know, it, it, it warms up just a little bit, but it's still windy and so on. So I think those places are really, really harsh um, uh, to live, at least from what I, um, uh, what I understood. Um, yeah, that's what I could share on that one. Yay, thank you. I want to just acknowledge that there is like this, a panel was supposed to be for an hour, but will be like for 15 or 20 minutes more. So just acknowledging time and if that's okay with you all. We, I feel like we still have some things there. So if someone has to go, we are really grateful. We understand just acknowledging time and responding like to the questions and like this idea of challenge for me, it's, I, I, I put it like that also because it's like, what is the opportunity? And like, I've worked in some projects that are like here in, like we are, we are a third world country. And um, I feel like uh, this idea of, uh, we had like a lot of NGOs that came here to tell communities how to do their own thing, right? And that's as, like brings a whole conversation and here um, indigenous population in the 80s, the ones that live in the rural areas near to the mountains, in the 80s, uh, something happened that was like a, a farmer's reform. And the idea was because of after coloniality, uh, the process of colonization, a lot of people were have, they didn't have land. So indigenous movement started to do many arrangements and like a political saying, hey, we need to own land because otherwise we just keep working for others and we don't have nothing. So there was this farmers reform and they put land to people and they said, but so thinking about progress and how these ideas from NGOs of, um, like how can we give them land and make them be more uh, efficient or make them grow food for themselves or things like that. They said, so we are going to give you land, but you need to make it productive land. 
So when we, like last week that we did this trip, and wherever we go to the mountains, we see that in the in the base of the mountains, there is a lot of agriculture. And that was like one way that indigenous movements, uh, like with NGOs and politics and things, they thought this was a good way at that time of to enter into this progress idea to 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 enter of this monoculture of of the land. So that's for us, for me, it's a challenge that it's in the rural areas because there's a lot of um, farmers grow like potatoes. We have hundreds of potatoes. They grow onions and they grow like these things that weren't that common before. So it is like a, a whole thing uh, because it like the next, uh, we, we live like a, 2,000, 3,000 meters, 400, 4,000 meters. And that's the limit where we can live, 4,000 meters. And then beyond, it's like protected areas of, of Paramo and the mountains there. And that over 4,000, we have uh, this protective land that, uh, that holds the water. I feel like if the world finish his, its water, we will have water. <laughs> like here in Ecuador, we have, lots lots of water that holds this part of the of of, of the name the, this part of the, the landscape and but also these uh farmers and this uh this monoculture it's damaging that four thousand part and beyond and i don't think that it, that's bad like it's not like oh farmers now needs to do something else but I feel that that's, it's part of the challenge here that we don't know, that we ignore that all of this production and this idea of monoculture came from this, um, this uh, system of, this capitalist system of producing. And sometimes I feel like in a country like Ecuador, for example, where we have the Andes, that bringing it into the awareness, it's kind of reclaiming our own ways of living with the mountains. And I feel that it's also an opportunity for, for me first to acknowledge that walking a mountain is sacred. And then how can I bring that into my life? How can I bring that into the conversation so we can reclaim our own knowledge systems and reclaim our own ways of being and not only reproduce what the system has told us to do. So for me, kind of reading the landscape and the ways we live is also like the question of not saying, oh, we need to do differently, but just coming back to ourselves, to me and say, how is this me or this was imposed? by others or by the system. So I feel that's a challenge for us here. And there's like uh, two projects that uh, for me, is, uh, one is called Cumbres Blancas, that white snows, where we are wondering about that. I don't know how that looks like now, but there is this project that comes from Colombia and Mexico, and now it's coming to Ecuador. And also how, people that visit the mountains, like in our mountaineering club, how can we bring that to awareness and what does that mean in everyday life? I feel that's a challenge still. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if any of you wants to share about the project or something that you're working on in your, in your highlands. And yeah, just to maybe talk about that, like some final, uh, like a final round, and then we open up for questions. I can, I can go. Yeah. Um, one of the things we're working on right now with, uh, with the center right here, that's the, that's our, that's our um, center in um, in the Demba Mountain. It's a mountain that used to be heavily impacted by mica mining, 
Um, after 30 years of mica mining, then it went to lumbering, logging, tree logging. And then 1998 in China, we had a really unseeable flood, again, a big flood uh, that impacted almost one, a quarter of the population in, in, in various ways. And then um, one of the reasons for that big flood was the Upper Yangtze River's uh, forest uh, divorce, deforestation. And our, our mountain, our village is one of them. And so one of the things that we, uh, um, we came here to to work with is to see how an education could be in in facility how an education or learning we call it um we it's better saying learning than education because that you know you um make the audience uh, much bigger than just an educational um, conversations. Uh, and we, we believe that learning would be a wonderful way to um, not only app, um, you know, understanding how we are related to the mountain, refreshing our knowledge because indigenous needs modernization and globalizations and industrialization. And that's like a cut um, a, and, and temporary empty from the from the knowledge pool and reconnect that um, knowledge I think that requires learning but also this stories and this 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 particular um, vibe could provide a wonderful opportunity for learning for kids from the big cities from outside um, of the mountainous areas even from other countries then we have students come to work with us to one on one hand learn about the scientific um, parts of um, those climatologies with the the water circulation and with the forestation the science with it but also learning how um, that that knowledge that needs to be connected from the previous indigenous knowledge of reverence towards the mountain and the rituals, the chorus, the sir ceremonies, all this, um, all these whole um, holistic uh, worldview connected with spiritual practice in this place. And that knowledge is calling to be revived again and and what can we do or how uh, what can we help in and connect reconnecting that um, knowledge to to belief again and one of the ways is to bring the students from outside to learn from the local elders to 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 help bring that knowledge uh, back and then the thirdly and everybody come here to help restore this um, this degraded ecosystems and that is not a one projects and that is probably projects over the next 10 or 20 years and to to it's something that gave us an opportunity to to be part of a bigger projects of a restoration so that's the currently where we are we had a wildfire in this mountain last year and in march and that is unseen for the past 60 years um, and this year we are yet to see maybe we'll have a water issue maybe we'll have another drought uh, we're all kind of anxious to see and we're desperately need you know experts but also the elders who understands um the part of the history is to come and work with this and so that's the that's the challenge, but an interesting, exciting projects that I am um, I am a part of, and I also welcome all of you who live in the you know live in the mountains who are perhaps facing similar issues, especially for our friends who live around the Himalayan mountain range. We would love to um, talk with you and work with you to share stories from you know different part of the same mountain range um, to see whether we could you know support each other even more. Yeah. Thank you, Andrea. Shall we shall we open dialogue with the speakers? Yeah, sorry, I, I, with the I think Pedro just wanted to share something. Yes. Oh, sorry. That's fine. No, just maybe very briefly. Um, so I'm, I've, I've, I've been very concerned with like um, uh, the archives of the mountaineering clubs here in Quito, because um, as a historian, um, one of the ways to study the past is through the archives of, I don't know, institutions, uh, so on and so on. And so I've been putting quite a lot of effort in uh, trying to at least take some pictures, document these archives, and also um, uh, doing some interviews. So I hope at some point in time I have a, a web page. I'll leave it in the description 
where I try to put from time to time in Spanish um, a little bit of information uh, on my research to share with the mountaineering community in Quito and, and uh, beyond. And um, yeah, I hope in that sort, in that way, um, I don't know, to, to make uh, mountaineering history also a little bit more of a, a talking subject and, and, and get more people interested uh, in it. So I leave it in the, in the description, in the chat, sorry. Thank you, Jairo. I also want to share uh, that uh, for me, it's been like um, a, like a way of saying, how can I co-create with the mountain? And what does that mean in my life? So we are also in a project that is called uh, Siguiendo Pasos Andinos, like following mountain footsteps, that um, we are bringing this historical uh, learnings from elders, from people that went through the mountains and do this visit to the chain mountaineering and like we go to the mountains so we go to Peru because that was the first mountain that an Ecuadorian went uh, like 50 years ago 70 years ago and um, so we are trying I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm trying and in this project also to bring these ideas of awareness of what are we doing in the mountains history to see how others have done it and conversations and to try to bring it into the space. How can I make a life with the mountains with me? So we have that also that project because following Andean footsteps, we want to go someday to Annapurna <laughs> to visit that elder. And that's like a like kind of our plan to visit them and then to bring their spirit also into the places that we are and our projects and our lives. So that kind of also it's part of it like um do you have something else or are we open for questions um i can i can i say one thing i'm um um i'm compelled to share in an invitation whether it's possible you know or just an invitation for imagination whether you know all these mountains globally as a university although we're trying to you know, create a different it's learning institutions and different mountains is the learning camps. And we are learning from the mountains and with each other. And we're also doing some service to our local mountains to be connected, but also be in service to our the mountains that we are um, um, living side by side with. What can we do? And, and what are the things that we could share with each other? And what are the things that we should archive? So we need scientists, maybe, you know, someone here could tell us, like, what are the marks that we should keep uh, when we're living here day by day? So one of the things that we keep is the phenomenal, you know, that the, the flowers and the local flowers and local climate day to day, we make an archive. Would that be sufficient? And imagine if these systems around the place that we could um, we could connect. And that, I think that itself, it brings wonderful historical archives, but also learning materials for uh, both scientists, but also, uh, yeah, for also whoever interested in it. Done. Mountain University. <laughs> so now we call um, for, maybe let's open if you have any questions. If you have any comments, you want to share something, Vanessa, please do. Vanessa? Yeah. Hello. Hi. Thank you so much, um, everyone, for sharing these wonderful connections um, and these very real stories, um, especially, is it... Um, Sorry, I forgot your name. Is it Yono and and Tao? Am I wrong? Um, Yoko and Tao. Yoko and Tao. I feel like when I was listening to your story, I feel the pressure of responsibility you have for your mountain and your place. Like you want to, you know, care for the environment by living the way you believe in and um i think a lot of i'm sure a lot of us feel the same whether it's 
not even maybe a mountain, but maybe even things like waste and energy and electricity and solar energy. And, you know, we're all thinking about how to how to do better in the place that we are. And, and the animals obviously do it so much better than we do because we're less connected from each other. But something I realized when I was gardening last two years ago, I, I broke my ankle. And... I, and I couldn't water my plants, you know? And I, I had all these dreams. I was like, oh man, like who, you know what? But then, but then I found a friend and, and a new neighbor. And she was also Chinese and she's downstairs. And she was like, I can help you. And you know, I was so embarrassed. I'm like, you know, younger than her. And she was pregnant at the time. And she's out there doing something like bacao, you know? She was just like, just, just she, and I was like, oh my God, that, Thing, the that's big stomach you know so big like eight months pregnant and she's like yeah I'm out here and I'm me me with my broken ankle and I'm like so much younger than her I have no children to take care of she already has another kid and you know we come from different places you know she grew up in Anhui you know she grew up around farmers you know we do have you know she grew up in a village you know, and, and something that I realized is like, it's a really difficult thing. I grew up in cities like Hong Kong, Beijing. It's really hard to do this without a village. Um, and I think the biggest problem with our societies now is like, we don't, we don't have villages that, that are merging the cities and the mountains. And something I've been thinking a lot about is like, how do mountains talk to cities? They're talking right? Like they're, they must be in conversation. And I grew up in this apartment complex that was on a mountain. So there was no distinction. I didn't go into the mountain. I was just on it. And in Hong Kong, there was a lot of typhoons. Like sometimes, you know, like the wind would just like, and then like, and the, you, you can hear it coming, this big typhoon on the mountain. It's so clear. And when I was a child, I remember I would just look up. I was in I wasn't in nature. I was in a parking lot, but I was in on the mountain at the same time. So it's like really integration of like humans and on a mountain, you know? And I would look up at the sky and I could feel I could feel the rain inside of me. I I could feel this typhoon and the emotion of the typhoon. And it was something that was so magical to me as an eight year old. I I remember at that moment I was like, oh, I I understand that there is this, there is rain <laughs> and and there is power in me that is like this rain. There's power in me like this typhoon. And then and, and I'm I think that awe of just being like, there is this big, big energy in this world that I'm connected to can be found and uh, yeah, I just wanted to thank you guys for inspiring all of these thoughts because I think, um, yeah, I think in some ways there's a call. This is a call for a new kind of village. Like we're all in different areas and now we're like, oh, we want all of our mountains to be in the same village. And I think that's really, really exciting. Thank you, Anissa. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you. Hey, Judith has a raised hand. Hi. Um, it's nice to have a space to talk about mountain beings. And I surprise myself because I'm sitting here rather upset, not, not of anything you said. Um, so I thought I'll, I'll share this. Yeah, because maybe I need to express it for the mountain, um, for this mountain. Um, <clears throat> so I, I have a project and I hope there's a way I could connect my project. So I'm, I'm now in Liverpool just so that I, I could ground myself. So I'm now in Liverpool. I'm born in the Philippines. I was in the Philippines last summer. That was in the month of July. And my project is in a remote farming community in a mountain in Southern Philippines. <laughs> this mountain, uh, she is covered with corn 
fields, corn plants, it's corn fields. And um, it's a dying mountain in a lot of ways. And so I thought I, I want to mention her here. So maybe, you know, the mountains <laughs> that, you know, could, could reach out to her and heal her because so all the plants, all the trees have gone from her. So she is uh, commodified and companies basically pay the communities that live there to basically plant corn. And then the, the so, so it works something like this. As the, I think the, the, the community told me this. So there are these different corporations. They are basically uh, companies of fertilizers. So they provide the corn ears to plant, and then they sell the fertilizers for the corn to grow in the mountain. So, and then the young children, because my project is uh, about um, how do we kind of recover, reclaim the, the resources of the communities for their own literacy program. You know, and I'm so interested in stories uh, that come, that they that could arise from, from this project. But obviously the stories I receive, some of it's about the mountain and, you know, the, the kind of the cry for help. And I was here, I was, so just like what you said, I was there and I have my PhD, but I don't know. <laughs> they don't need my PhD there. Uh, I don't know. I want. I, I feel like I wanted to be a farmer or some, you know, somebody else just to help the mountain to kind of reclaim its trees and its ecosystem or biodiversity. But so they were telling me that when I visited, it was a good time for me to visit because I could see it green. Yeah, because they are after they harvest the corn. It's all going to be brown. And they didn't want me to see that. And I think just the thought of seeing the mountain as bare <clears throat> and unable then to provide to the community because of the monoculture, Andrea, as you said, the monoculture, after they harvest, like, I think that was in October, there's nothing. So they wait now for, I don't know how many months, so this 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 mountain, this mag, you know magnif majestic, magnificent being, is should be able to provide for for all the beings around it. It's not able to because it has been its ability to has been stolen by capitalist systems. And and yeah, I just want to share that. So I, I think I feel upset. So I I'm trying to imagine uh, to uh, you know the the. The, the communities, the children, they Facebook me, <laughs> they tell me stories, but I always think about the mountain, you know, the mountain needs help. I need to kind of, uh, you know, uh, do something. Um, I've spoken to some elders and they, they, they cry for their mountains, for the trees that they could no longer plant because the requirement is just plant corns because we only provide fertilizers for the corn. We don't provide for anything else. So, so yeah, so I hope in, in bringing their stories here, um, you know, some of the energies of aliveness in this space could reach out to that mountain. Thank you. Thank you, Judy. Thank you for sharing that story. And please put your email so we can connect. It will be really nice to keep sharing stories. At least that is what we can do, I feel. And maybe see, let's see what happens to put it. I feel sometimes when we put this on the middle, it's kind of holding the space together for that and see how we can, yeah, how can we support each other in many ways? Thank you for sharing. It's my heart is like, oh. So painful to hear, but thank you for sharing. It's really, really nice. Someone else has something else that wants to come in, please. Hi. First of all, thank you for sharing. Judith and everyone. It was so 
nice to s listen this stuff. And I had like taken something that Andre said, uh, some question, and it's like I would share a, an anecdote uh, to ask my question. And it's when I started to do mountain, to go to the mountains, um, I didn't know what's happening, you know, like what's going on? Uh, I can walk, I, what's going on? And then I started to go to another mountains and my body started to normal acclimatize. And I went to do Cayambe, the Sagulation in Ecuador, and I couldn't. And I literally cried for a week, like cry all, all the week, but it wasn't because I couldn't. It was because in some deep way, I feel like I was uh, passing for uh, shitty stuff. And I feel like the mountain was telling me stuff, uh, but it wasn't because I couldn't do, go to the top, to the mountain. And for me, well, that was the moment that I realized, like I passed the, this line for me to say, okay, this is so much energy. Um, like here happened a lot of stuff, you know? And uh, my question is kind of, for me was this experience. And um, and for others, I guess it's like with more with time, not a directly uh, experience, but I don't know for you guys or for any one of you happen like with, with a specific experience or it, it's some with time, you know? I am clear what I'm asking. I don't know if I'm clear. <laughs> Um, do you want to ask in Spanish so I can translate it? I, I, I don't have it super clear. Es como, um, yo, como con lo del Cayambe, eh, mm -hmm. lloré full y ahí entendí como el nivel de energía que tiene la montaña que para mí como se transformó. O sea, es como si sí, siempre quise ser montaña y iba a, iba a glaciar y de repente sabía que había algo más, como algo súper espiritual, súper fuerte. Mm -hmm. Y de ahí como fue otra manera de ver la montaña, como de cambiar la, el chip. Mm -hmm. Sí, me explico. Entonces, como, no sé si para alguien fue como así, como ah, una experiencia, yeah, yeah. o fue como a lo largo del de caminito, así. Okay. Bridget, I, I don't know if, I, if you understand before, but I, now I do, I do, so I want to translate it. Um, so she's asking, she's saying that when she had this profound experience, uh, she, in this healing part, she felt like there was something beyond, like a spiritual force, like spiritual something. So she's just, she wants to know if someone else has that feeling of having like this is something spiritual, something like, a, like, like something there that goes beyond. I could say yeah. something on that. Yeah. I think... The, the mountain uh, humbles you always, um, especially if you go mountaineering. Um, it will always be uh, uh, in some sort of way uh, um, a learning or, 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 or you will, you, you need to open your heart in some sort of way to be able to receive a lesson, whatever that lesson may be. Um, and so I've, I've had this discussion with Andrea a couple of weeks ago um, or months, I think. And I don't consider myself particularly a, a spiritual person, but I think mountaineering is a profound spiritual uh, practice. Um, so what I would say is like, I think just continue exploring because um, the, the more you explore the mountains, the more uh, profound and the, the deeper uh, this experience will uh, become. Um, so yeah, let's go to the mountains, Tammy. <laughs> Thank you. And one more, the, there is one more question. Um, I've got three. <laughs> you have your hand raised. <laughs> I've got three. Do you want to share something? <laughs> no, maybe it was a mistake that you raised your hand. <laughs> or, um, yeah. 
I think we have to. Hello. Oh, there. Hello? Yes. Yes. There you are. You want to oh, share your okay. name? Also? <laughs> Oh well, I you know I was sort of hesitated if I if I should share, but um, you know it's just some you know by accident, but I'm I guess it's a good one. <laughs> anyway, um, I want to say thank you for uh, hosting this because uh, I just been recently um, you know, starting to looking at uh, you know all of these uh, possibilities of uh, um uh, of of reorganizing uh, my life. And partially is that, uh, I guess I do have this, um, this uh, you know, past experiences that have been connected with uh, the mountains that all, all around the world. And I have saw some of your, uh, you know, guest speakers, amazing, uh, you know, your, uh, uh, you know, traveling or uh, your residential, you know, experiences that are around, um, the mountains and then I just uh, had that um, uh, thing uh, which um, uh, it's a little bit um, I mean it's it's kind of like all of this obstacles and uh, you know and having all of this courage to go and living in the mountains um, and to live like more uh, you know naturally you know all of these uh, I could see there is a lot of, um, I would say, benefit that comes from this, um, you know, and somehow I personally, because I, uh, my father has been recently uh, get very, uh, uh, get very ill in the hospital. So I also wanted to took, um, uh, you know, my families in, but, you know, it's just, um, I was wondering if anyone um, in this, uh, uh, you know, group have some experiences of um, of about uh, um, healing, you know, about uh, where or possibly I could find this kind of um, uh, either it could be a rehabilitation center or some kind of um, a place could help on getting people's health better. Uh, that's my question. Uh, and besides that, also I wanted to relate to a little bit about uh, the speakers from uh, Japan. Uh, I've been looking at a site in Japan. Um, uh, sorry, I, 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 I can't say the, the Japanese name, but uh, it's, um, it's a location that uh, I have very attracted to. But uh, uh, maybe later on I can, uh, uh, you know, connect it with you so I can give you some information about that place. So you can tell me if that's something uh, can be uh, related to what you were doing as well. Um, but anyway, that's my questions. Thank you. Hi, um, sorry, I don't, you know, I don't know your name. If I can give a very quick oh, uh, My name answer. is Luna. Luna, and are you, where are you based, Luna? Uh, right now, I'm in um, uh, I'm in China, uh, in the a city very close to Shanghai. Okay. And yeah. Okay. Um, you know, there obviously we're not able to give any medical <laughs> advices here. Um, things about the healings. I think Mountain does have that healing power as we all shared. Um, also, I think, well, just to general, to show that I think a lot of health problems arise from um, and mental issues. That's where I think um, a lot of um, uh, indigenous um, medicine and knowledge will probably um, tell the same, that um, um, environment and mind and body um, are interconnected. Um, having that, that maybe a story, um, maybe a, a trip in the mountain might help. I know that where you are around Shanghai doesn't have mountains because I used to live there. It doesn't have it doesn't have many mountains. It does have um, a forest, a lot of trees around in near Hangzhou area. Um, if you like to be in a in a 
in a mountainous areas, probably going west is is the best. Um, but well, if it depends on what exactly are you looking for, there are um, various alternative healing uh, method that you could you could try, and then that could maybe a different. Um, a different conversation, Andrea, about the mountains and the healings for the next time. Um, if you sent me a message, um, I sent my uh, email there, and then I might be able to appoint some people around China. I can't promise, but I will. I will try. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, are we in the same WeChat group? And just in case, uh, um, this yeah, okay, great. Thank you, yeah. thank you, everyone. I think we we've got like a thirty minutes beyond. Um, I, I, there is another like the last conference today. Maybe if someone wants to share something to close, um, I'm I, I uh, Lisa, you want to share something? <laughs> Lisa is like, are we okay with having just one more story? I think, yeah. If we are okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I live on Menominee land in Wisconsin in the United States. This is an area that has no mountains. My state has one small mountain. It's not really a mountain. And that's another story. But I want to say that I live on Menominee land. And this is a carved stone that's 12,000 years old. That This was a medicine plant area. and um, it's a buffalo stone, but it also represents a, a mastodon. So I hold this sometimes, but I wasn't holding it when I had this vision in my lineage. Um, I had a vision of the base of a mountain. And I saw, um, I saw the earth taken from the base of the mountain creating pathways, but none of the soil left the uh, mountain. But there were pathways that were being created in all directions under the mountain and they were organic pathways creating like rooms and then the rooms connected. And I understood that this was space for people uh, to be connected in all these ways and the paths came together. And I have held this um, vision for a couple of years now. And last year I attended the conference and I heard the, for the first time, this idea of mountainous pedagogy. I have had 20 years working in education, mostly teaching world language and English as a new language. K-12, beautiful. Uh, and then I planted trees here, 200 trees, native trees, um, a suburban lot that's not very big. So this vision and the work that you're doing and living and the stories now has come into this new way for me around the uh, story as a way to create us, uh, these pathways for us. And ironically, there's no ceiling in stories. So we're under the mountain and enriched by everything, the wisdom that is so deep in the earth now, we're having new technology to find out more um, about the deep, deep wisdom of earth, not just from the web telescope in the sky, but also underneath. So I'm just so grateful for all the work that you have done. I also had a moment of revelation on a train in the, on, in the Andes where I understood the vastness of the uh, emerald view I saw and my own tiny part created all together as part of it. So like you spoke before about the humility and the wonder. So I just am appreciating this conference and I uh, wish I could be in every session. So thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. And with that, I feel we have extended a lot more than we we had to. But uh, here we have like this saying of the world needs to unfold. So we kind of prioritize where the world 
wants to go. And um, I'm really grateful that we were able to hold that together. So, um, um, so I'm going to close now um, the, the space. You have our contacts or emails. If you want to contact someone, please let me know. And thank you, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Yoko and Tao. Thank you, Hero. Thank you, Xinling. Thank you to the Alps. <laughs> thank you to the Himalayas. And thank you to the Andes. And thank you to Judith's mountain also. And all of the mountains that we bring. Thank you.